Hi. So um, as Nicole mentioned, I'm a PhD student um, at UBC, and I'm in the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies. And today I'm going to be talking to you about my favorite group of organisms, which are parasites. And I'm going to be talking to you about um, parasite manipulation of host behavior. Now, this actually isn't my research at all, and I'll sort of touch on my research to give you an idea of what I actually do. This is just something that I think is super cool, and I hope that you think it's super cool too by the end. So um, my research actually deals with rats in Vancouver. Um, you may have heard of the Vancouver Rat Project before. So essentially here in Vancouver we have rats. They're everywhere. Um, they're particularly problematic in the downtown east side where you have a lot of people living on the streets. They're in close contact with rats. And rats carry a number of diseases. And there's a high risk then when people are in contact with rats that they could receive some of these diseases from the rats. And so um, how do parasites fit into this? Well, rats can transmit disease to people, and they can transmit disease to other rats, and their fleas can do that too. So my job on the Vancouver Rat Project is to essentially look at the fleas that live on rats and see if they carry anything that's dangerous to humans. Um, and so usually when I get to this point, people start thinking, well, that's pretty gross. Like you study parasites and you study rats. Like neither of those is particularly endearing. And I would like to argue that rats are pretty adorable when you put them in tiny <laughs> outfits. Um, there's actually nothing cuter than this. And so at least you can dress rats up a little bit and redeem them somehow. Parasites don't really work the same way. You can't take a tapeworm and put it in a Snuggie and expect people to think that that tapeworm is now really cute. Um, first, you'd have to construct the Snuggie, which would be a whole other level of difficult. And, um, and still, I don't think it would do much of a job. So instead of showing you adorable pictures of parasites, I'm going to have to do something to show you why they're so, so cool. And I think I'm ready to do that. So parasites. Parasites are any organism that derive a benefit from another organism. So they take from it. They take nutrients. They take shelter. They take any number of things. And parasites are incredibly diverse. And we're going to capture or touch on some of this diversity. There's somewhere between 75,000 and 300,000 species of parasites. And that's probably even an underestimate. So there's lots and lots out there. Um, and we sort of fit them into two very broad categories to start out. So we have endoparasites. Endo means inside. So endoparasites are those parasites that live inside of you. And we have ectoparasites. Ecto means outside. So parasites that would live, for example, on your skin, in your hair, something along those lines. And believe you me, when I say parasites can infect pretty much every area of you. So um, as examples of endoparasites, we have some that infect the digestive tract, the intestines. So this is Giardia. You may have heard of it before. Um, beaver fever is a common term for it. Um, you can get it if you're out hiking and you drink some infected water, running through one of those really clean looking brooks that isn't actually so clean. Um, you can have a nice bout of diarrhea from these guys. So um, always filter your water when you're out hiking. And then one that. Most people know about, so here's a tapeworm. Those guys get incredibly long, and they feed off nutrients within your digestive tract. So here you have two very different organisms. Um, this guy here is just very, very small, microscopic, and these guys can get quite large, and both of those will live in the intestine. Then you have those that can actually live in the blood. So here we have malaria, and here we have something called um, sleeping sickness, which is caused by trypanosomes. And these guys are absolutely beautiful. I'm sure if you have them, you don't really take the time to think that, but they are quite gorgeous. So um, malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes. It'll pick up malaria from one host in a blood meal, fly on to another host, and give that malaria to the next host. Um, symptoms of malaria are chills, sweating, and uh, you can get recurring symptoms of malaria. Trypanosomes, on the other hand, um, there's two very common types of disease caused by trypanosomes. One's called African sleeping sickness. That's transmitted by a fly, a tsetse fly. Um, the other is called Chagas disease, and that's more in South America, and that's transmitted by um, adorably named kissing bugs. And so um, both of these are transmitted by insects in this case. 
And then finally, we have the parasites that live on you, on your skin. I'm sure we're all familiar with ticks. We get them on our dogs. We get them on our cats. We get them on us. Um, ticks are famous right now, especially for transmitting Lyme disease, which is quite a concern. Um, and then we also have fleas. My favorite, of course. Uh, fleas are, as far as diseases that they transmit, are really known for the big bad, which is uh, the plague caused by Yersinia pestis. The plague wiped out tons of people um, back in the 13 and 1400s. So and, uh, fleas would pick up Yersinia pestis from one host, and they would move from a rat, for example, jump onto a person, and you would get it from that rat. So these are two. Um, organisms which will transmit diseases through their blood meals as well. So as you can see, a lot of diversity in your intestines, in your blood, on your skin. They're everywhere. And to draw a distinction, so I've been talking about parasites, but we're also going to talk about parasitoids today. So parasites will live on or in the host, and they'll derive this benefit from the host, so they'll feed on the host. But the main thing that makes it different from a parasitoid is that it does not kill the host. It doesn't want to kill the host. If the host dies, it's sayonara for the parasite. So it wants that host to keep living, and it'll keep feeding on that host. Parasitoids, on the other hand, a little bit more vicious. They actually will kill the host in the end. And that's all part of their game plan. And we'll see a couple really neat examples of that today, too. So what makes a host? You probably host dinner parties sometimes. People come and you feed them, and it's this really lovely situation. Maybe you share a glass of wine. Uh, not quite the same. I mean, sort of the same in that you're feeding the parasite, but not nearly as uh, friendly, perhaps. So what makes a host? Any organism that harbors another on or in itself. So if you have an organism that's feeding off of you, you are a host. And literally everything can be a host. Spiders, insects, vertebrates like reptiles and birds, um, plants. You, this is me dressed up like a parasitized ant for Halloween a few years ago. Um, this is my ant head. That's the fungus coming out of my head. We're going to talk about that later today, too. Not a lot of people got it, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I thought I was really cool, so I think that that's probably all that matters. But literally, anything can be a host. And parasites themselves can be hosts. There are parasites of parasites. And we'll talk about that a little bit near the end. And so when we think of parasites, we think of them sometimes, I think, as really simplistic organisms. You think of a tapeworm, and it's ooey and gooey, and there's really not that much going on. I mean, it's long, but how complicated can it be? And I would argue that parasites are some of the most complicated organisms out there. They change their body style all the time. Um, they have to get through numbers of different hosts. And I'd like to illustrate that with this life cycle, which is really one of my favorites. So this is a trematode called Dichrosuelium. Name's not important. But the adult of the parasite, so here's the adult, it lives in this cow. And the cow is called a definitive host. Now, a definitive host is the host in which the adult parasites reproduce. So we've got the adults. They're having babies in the cow. That's our definitive host. They lay their eggs, and the eggs come out in the cow's feces. Now, the parasite needs to get back into that cow somehow, because it needs to become an adult and lay eggs again, and it needs the cow. So what's it going to do? Well. It does a couple things. So first, along comes a snail. They love eating cow poop. So they come along, and they eat up the eggs that are in this cow poop. And the parasite enters the snail, and it changes its body form. So here, um, this is called a myricidium, and then it changes into this cercaria, and, and it stays in the snail. So it, it changes its body form completely, the whole thing. And this host here is called an intermediate host, because the parasite lives inside of it, but it doesn't reproduce. Okay. Now, what's the next step? Well, the parasites come out in the snail slime. So here they are. They come out in that nice little snail slime. And you know what loves to eat snail slime? Ants. They love it. They just love snail slime. So they come along, and they eat up the snail slime, and they get the parasite inside of them. OK, so now we have two intermediate hosts. And that parasite needs to get back into the cow. Cows aren't really known for just feeding on ants, so it has to do something pretty amazing to get back inside that cow. And what's it going to do? Well, in the evening, ants tend to go underground with all their ant buddies. 
But not this ant, not this parasitized ant. What it's going to do is the parasite is going to manipulate its brain. Okay? It's going to change everything going on in there. And the ant is instead going to climb up onto a blade of grass, latch onto that blade of grass, and stay there overnight. And when the cows come to graze at dusk, when they're eating the grass, they get the ants that are hanging out on the blades of grass and back into the cow you have it, and the whole thing goes again. So here you have a parasite that not only has three hosts, it has one definitive and two intermediate hosts, and it's changing its body form, and it's manipulating an ant to make it go up onto a blade of grass and hang out there overnight. That's smarter than I think anything I could come up with. So it's pretty amazing. And we think of them as so simplistic, and they're not. And this isn't even a particularly complicated life cycle. Some parasites have three or four intermediate hosts. So it's pretty amazing. So we're going to talk about this manipulation. That's a really great example of parasite manipulation. And we're going to talk about this in a couple contexts. So I want you to think about manipulation sort of like you're a puppet master. You've got this organism or this other individual here, and it's on your puppet strings, and you're playing with it to make it do what you want. And so we're going to talk about these alterations in host behavior and appearance, which are caused by the parasite or induced by the parasite, and result in benefit for that parasite. There are lots of other changes we could see. Um, hosts can change their behavior because they're trying to get rid of a parasite, for example. We don't care about those. We want to know about the ones that parasites are doing to manipulate their host so they can finish their life cycle. So we're going to start off with one of my favorites. And we're going to start off in appearance. So this is an adorable little snail. And um, this little snail is host to a parasite called Leucochloridium. And the definitive host, so remember the host in which the parasite reproduces, is a bird. So it moves between a bird and a snail, does this cycle. So in the bird, the parasite lays its eggs. And they come out. And this, this parasite's a little worm. It's a trematode comes out in the feces, and the snail comes along and gobbles it up. OK, so now our parasite is in the snail at least, so we're good there. But the problem is that the birds don't really go around eating snails. That's not really their food source normally. They'll eat other things. Um, can you think of some things that a bird might eat? What do you think of birds eating? Worms. Worms. Great. Early bird catches the worm. They love worms. So. This guy doesn't really look like a worm, but you can imagine then that the parasite might make it look like a worm. And that's exactly what it does. It makes the eye stalks look a little something like this. So it goes inside of the snail, and it infects the eye stalks right here. And it goes up into these eye stalks, and you can see it changes the color, so it sort of has this look of a worm or a caterpillar or something that the bird might eat. And it doesn't just do that. That's the best part. It doesn't just do that. Um, because this is great. I mean, it looks like a caterpillar now. But it really needs to catch that attention. Oh, and another interesting point is that it tends to infect the left side first. They don't know why. Um, you can see in this case, both eye stalks are infected. But generally, it'll be the left one first. So here's a little video, which I just love, of the infected snail. So. The parasite goes into the eye stalks and forms something called brood sacs. And they're just filled with other little tinier parasites. And they throb like this. And why do you think they throb? What does that look like if you were a worm? Yeah, looks like you're moving. Looks like you're inching along. So now not only do you look like a little worm or a caterpillar, you're kind of acting like one too, which is pretty crazy. And so the bird sees this, and it swoops down and it bites off one of these eye stalks. Now remember, parasites don't typically kill their hosts. That's what parasitoids do. Leucochloridium is not considered to be a parasitoid. A bird can swoop down and bite off the eye stalk of one of these snails without killing the snail. So it can come down and grab one and fly away, and now the bird's infected. Um, here's some brood sacs that have been removed from a snail. And remember, they're filled with lots of other smaller little parasites, which is really quite amazing. So that is sort of a, a direct effect. But another thing that happens. Um, from the parasite infecting the eye stalk. So they use the eye stalks to, de to detect light and dark. And now they've got something in there that's messing up their ability to do that. So instead of hanging out on the ground like a smart little snail, um, it's out in the light. So you're out in the light where a bird can see you. Your eye stalks now look like their food source, and they're moving like their food source. So three pretty amazing changes that help facilitate transmission of that parasite back into the bird. 
This is another one of my absolute favorite examples. We're still talking worms. These are nematodes, so they're smaller little worms. Um, here's an ant. It's a canopy ant in Peru. And these little ants are infected by um, this little nematode parasite. And once again, the definitive, or not the definitive host, actually the definitive host in this case is the ant. The intermediate host is a bird. So we still have this bird and ant life cycle. And when the parasite infects the ant, um, we see some pretty amazing changes. So what's the, what's the first change that you notice? Here's our infected ant. What's different? He's red. He's red. Exactly. He's got a red abdomen. So think of his bum here. It's all red, all different from this guy. And so that's one big change in appearance that we notice. But there's a few other changes. The first is something called gaster flagging. What gaster flagging is, so here we have our regular ant, and its abdomen, its bum, is near the ground. In this case, it's pushed up. So it's like the ant is sort of presenting its abdomen upwards towards potentially a bird. The next is de decreased aggression. So normally you would think if a bird came in to bite you, you'd be all aggressive. You wouldn't like that very much. These guys are a little bit more chill. They're OK. They're not going to put up as much of a fight. They also have a weakened junction of the abdomen. So this is usually a pretty strong point right here. Um, in these guys, it becomes really weak. So you could go in and just snap the abdomen off. And why is that important? The parasites are all in the abdomen. So the parasites are fed. So they're, they're in the bird feces. They're fed to larval ants by adult ants. And then as the larvae progress, they move into the abdomen of the ant, and they set up shop there, creating smaller and smaller little nematode parasites. So they're in there, weakening the abdomen, causing it to go up. They think the gaster flags because there's pressure on the, um, the nerve cord, which causes it to atrophy and raise. And now they're not as aggressive. And the final interesting point, and why this is interesting you'll see in a second, is that the brighter the color, the more infectious. So that's when the nematodes are at their most infectious. So why do we care? We know all these things now. Well, the birds that happen to feed on these little ants don't normally feed on them. They actually feed on, so there's our infected ant and a bunch of uninfected ants. They actually feed on fruit. So here's our ant. There's its abdomen. There's a fruit right next to it. Do those not look strikingly similar? They are so similar. And actually, if you were to take a color profile and look at them, so here you have an uninfected ant, um, you have your infected ant, and you have red fruit, and they do some wavelength analysis and reflectance. And they find these two are really similar. So you've got a parasite that goes into the abdomen and makes it look like the bird's fruit, fruit choice, its favorite kind of food. You make it less aggressive so that if a bird comes in to bite it, it's not really going to put up a fight. You make that junction between the abdomen and the rest of the ant really weak so you can just rip it off. And then you also make it its most attractive to the bird when the parasite itself is its most infectious. Lots of things going on there. And there you can see again the abdomen of the ant and a nice little fruit right next to it. So um, we focused mostly on uh, appearance there. There was some behavioral changes. But now we're going to look at some pretty amazing behavioral changes. I like to call this one the bodyguard. And so does everybody else. So I'm really not that creative in it. Um, we're going to be talking about parasitoid wasps for the next two examples because they're so cool. And we've got a couple examples here up at the front. So you can come up and have a look at them later if you like. These parasitoid wasps lay eggs inside of this little caterpillar. And they could lay up to 80 eggs. And they lay the eggs inside the caterpillar for a couple reasons. One, when the eggs are in the caterpillar, they hatch, and you've got your larvae there. And they feed on the caterpillar, so now they've got food. And they also have protection. They're not out in the open. They can't be eaten by really anything else unless the caterpillar gets eaten. So they've got protection. They've got a constant food source. Now that's all well and fine. The caterpillar kind of goes about its business. I'm sure it's not feeling so great, but it's you know, it's still doing its thing. Until those larvae need to pupate. So in order to go from a larva 
back into our adult wasp, it has to form a cocoon and it has to get wings and all of those things that make it a wasp. And it can't do that inside of the caterpillar. So imagine if you will, you're a caterpillar and you have 80 eggs that are now larvae inside of you. And this is the thing of horror stories. They erupt through the sides of the caterpillar. They slowly chew their way out. And the caterpillar does not die. I would want to die. <laughs> the caterpillar does not die. It lives. And now you've got all these little baby parasite or wasps. They're here, and they're pupated. So they go out onto a stalk, for example. They form their little cocoons, and they're doing their thing. A couple of these wasps stay behind. And they manipulate the caterpillar's behavior. And why would they need to manipulate the behavior? Well, once these little wasps are pupated, they're actually at risk of predation from other insects. Those ins other insects could come along, like this guy, could come along and eat them or kill them somehow. And they don't want that. So a couple of these little wasps stay inside the caterpillar and manipulate it to act as a bodyguard. And what the caterpillar will do is it will set up shop next to these wasps, will hang out, and then if threatened, it will thrash until the threat is gone. So we can watch that right here. Here we have an approach. No. And resume. <laughs> And if you look at one of these caterpillars when they're uninfected, they don't care. If you have a similar insect on top of them, they're just whatever. They don't mind at all. So pretty amazing behavioral change. Along the same vein, we have another parasitoid wasp. This one actually lays one egg onto the back or the abdomen of an orb-weaving spider. So these are these beautiful spiders. If you're not such a fan of spiders, I guarantee you you're about to feel pretty bad for them. So um, that'll be a nice change for you. But they lay a little egg out here on the outside of the abdomen of the spider. And you might think, OK, I just saw 80 larvae come out of a caterpillar. One seems like no big deal. Well, that larva will attach to the outside, and it'll grow, and it'll slowly feed on that spider. And the spider goes about its normal business. It's you know, it's just one larva. Who cares, right? It just keeps doing its thing. And the larva continues to grow. Now, as we saw with the last example, the larva needs to pupate. So it needs a place to pupate. It needs support so it can pupate. It needs food so it can pupate. So what it'll do, after about two weeks of slowly feeding on this spider, it will start to change the spider's behavior. And the spider that normally builds a web that looks like this, beautiful, spider web, one you would typically see, now builds a web like this. So it builds a web that is really strong and can bear support from the middle. So it'll build this web. The spider will crawl up into the middle, lay itself out. And the parasite, or the wasp larva, will now um, secrete a chemical which kills the spider. It will suck it dry, throw the carcass away dramatically, and then build a cocoon and suspend itself from the middle of this much more fortified and strong web. So didn't even thank the spider for all the work that it did, just ate it, and then, um, and then finished its life cycle. And no talk would really be complete unless we kind of moved on from, so we've done parasitoid wasps now. We've talked about a few different kinds of worms. Um, now we're going to talk about a fungus that you may have heard about before called cordyceps. And uh, cordyceps is a fungus which infects a lot of different kinds of insects and arthropods. So here we have an ant. Um, there's fungus coming out of the ant right there. We have another insect with a whole bunch of different fruiting bodies of that fungus here. Uh, a moth absolutely covered in that lovely fungus. And then a spider down here. So they infect a broad range. Um, there's lots of different species of cordyceps fungus. And um, they're really quite amazing. So they use the body of their insect host as nutrients. And they also use it in a very amazing way to infect other organisms. So this is a video um, from the BBC, I believe, of the cordyceps fungus. And what will happen, so we'll, we'll play this in a second. Um, an ant will be out and about, and it will have some of the spores of the fungus fall on them. And the spores will burrow through the exo 
skeleton. So um, think of that as a nice hard shell around your body, nice and supportive. They'll bore right through that inside of the ant in this case. And they'll manipulate the ant's behavior. And the ant will climb up on a stick in some species. Um, in others, it will go onto the underside of a leaf. And it will take its mouth parts, called mandibles, mouth parts, latch on there. And that's called the death grip. And it will die there. The fungus will then kill the ant, and it will grow. And so here's a, here's a nice little video of that. So our ant has already been manipulated. It's climbed up onto a twig. And then here you can start to see the fungus, the fruiting body of the fungus growing out of the head of the ant. Um, other things that you'll sometimes see is fungus will come out of the ant down here and sort of form a, a protective case to hold it onto the twig or onto the leaf to be more supportive. And it'll grow, grow, grow. And then once it's done growing, it will rain out spores. And spores are that, they need those spores to infect other ants. That's the infective part that goes inside of the other ants. So they need to finish this, and then spores will come out. Now, why do they manipulate them up? Why do they manipulate them on the underside of a leaf? A couple of reasons. So this was a really interesting study uh, back in 2009, and they've done quite a bit more research since. But so here we have our ant on the underside of a leaf. And what they found is that ants in their study were typically about 25 centimeters from the ground. And they hypothesized that the reason for this was because things that were required for the fungus to grow, such as a specific humidity, like moisture, or a specific heat, were found at these heights. And that's exactly what they found. So we have the ants here around 25 centimeters high. You see that humidity and temperature are both, they're, they're pretty specific. They're not that variable. Whereas when you get to higher heights from the ground, there's a lot more variability there. And they took ants that were at this height that were just starting to grow fungi, and they moved them. They moved them lower. They moved them higher. And they found that the fungus wasn't as able to grow. So, uh, oh, and they also found here that they tend to be more in the northwest um, orientation underside the leaf, which they believed also had something to do with these perfect conditions for the fungus to grow. So the fungus is there. It's growing perfectly. The ant has taken it to its favorite place in the whole world. And it's put it on the underside of a leaf because it needs to get into other ants. And if you have the fungus coming out of the ant's head towards the ground, it can rain, literally rain down on other ants. The spores can rain down upon them, and they can infect other ants. This is pretty amazing. So moving on um, from the fungus, we're going to get to a couple here. So why should you care about you? Can you be manipulated? And I'm going to tell you that you can be and that you are, potentially. Um, toxoplasma is one that you may have heard of before. Toxoplasma is a small protozoan parasite. So imagine microscopic, very small. And typically um, moves between ants, or not ants. I love ants, so I'm really used to talking about them. But cats and mice or rats. And they have this life cycle together. So the parasite infects the cat. That's its final definitive host. Um, the oocysts, which you can kind of think of, I guess, like eggs, they come out. They go into the mouse. The mouse eats it in the poop. And then it has to get back into the cat. Some changes that they found in mice and rats as a result of being infected with toxoplasma are that uh, mice and rats that are infected tend to be less afraid of cats. So they're more likely to go near to a cat. Now, the cat then has a much easier source of food, and the parasite is more likely to get into the cat. Not only do they tend to be less afraid, they also have sort of an attraction to the smell of cat urine. So you're not that afraid, and maybe you're actually going to go seek out areas where there are cats. Infected uh, mice and rats also have increased reaction times. So what that means is they can't react as quickly. So if you have a cat that runs at you, it might take you an extra couple seconds to think about where you're going to go, and you really needed those extra couple seconds to get away, and now you don't have it. So all of these things are believed to help transmit that parasite from the cat from the rat back into the cat. And so um, here's the life cycle of toxoplasma. So here we have our definitive host, which is the cat. Um, here are those oocysts. 
They come out in the cat feces and they infect. Well, here's a mouse or a rat. You'll notice you're here too. Uh, we've got sheep, we've got poultry, kangaroos, foxes. I mean, they infect lots of different things. Um, and so the most common life cycle that you'll see is the cat then giving it to something like a rat or a mouse and then the cat gets it again. <clears throat> now when it gets into you, the cat doesn't really eat you. I mean, your cat that you have might want to eat you. There might have been cats, you know, much longer ago when that was actually a risk. You could have been eaten by a large cat. Not so much of a risk anymore, thankfully. Um, but you can imagine then that there might be some sorts of behavioral changes that would occur in you that the parasite is still trying to get you into that cat. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, I just want to point out also that there's a few other ways that you can become infected with toxoplasma. Uh, one is if you would eat infected meat. So let's say sheep, a sheep is infected. Um, you eat the meat of that organism, you could become ill. Um, and then another is you can actually pass that to your offspring. So if you're pregnant at the time of infection, you can actually pass that to your offspring and they can become infected. Uh, you may have heard before that women who are pregnant should not clean litter boxes. We're going to talk about, I mean, cats secreted in their feces, so if you're being exposed to the feces, um, your risk of acquiring that parasite is potentially higher. And um, the risk to the mother might not be so great, but to the fetus it is quite great. So um, there are a lot of developmental um, issues that arise when a woman becomes pregnant when she is pregnant, or becomes infected when she's pregnant. So Cleaning the litter box when you're pregnant is a no-no. So you can pass it that way as well. But behavioral changes, what about those? Those are obviously the coolest. So when we think about this, we kind of think of that whole <laughs> crazy cat lady thing, um, and which isn't really an accurate depiction, but I like it, so it's up there anyway. Um, similar to mice, in people we see increased reaction times. There is a strange correlation between car accidents and people infected with toxoplasma. So you might not be able to react so quickly when you're driving or something along those lines. Um, there's also a link between the initiation of severe forms of schizophrenia and toxoplasma infection. Toxoplasma is believed to influence the amount of dopamine that you have, and dopamine is also um, an issue with schizophrenia, and so there is quite a strong link between um, schizophrenia in individuals and infection with toxoplasma. Another is changes in sociability. Men who are infected with toxoplasma tend to become less social. Women tend to become more social. There's also a study that men who were infected with toxoplasma tended to go outside with their shirts all ruffled and not as well kept. I'm not really sure what that had to do with it as much. Maybe recklessness. I don't care about your appearance as much. Um, and you might argue that maybe some of these things aren't a result of toxoplasma, but maybe they're making you more likely to get toxoplasma. And people have sort of thought about that, and they've gone about some studies. But what they've shown is that symptoms, these symptoms actually increase with time. So there's a very strong link between it actually being caused by toxoplasma infection. But not to fear. Okay, This is my cat. This is Gizmo. She may be crazy, but I don't think she has toxoplasma. Um, you don't have to go home and get rid of your cats or throw out your litter boxes. Cats themselves in your home are not your greatest risk to toxoplasma. If you have an indoor cat, it's unlikely that they even have toxoplasmosis. Um, one third of the population already has it. You might even have toxoplasma now. The major risk factors for toxoplasma are actually gardening and having a sandbox outside. It's really feral wild cats who are running around doing their business in your gardening and doing their business in your sandbox. So if you have a sandbox at home, we recommend covering it up when you're not in it and making sure you don't have um, cats in there having a good time. And as far as human-induced or human-related behavioral changes, I'm going to finish with this one, which I really like. The science is OK. I mean, it's a great first start. But what essentially they wanted to look at is, well, let's start this way. Parasites probably influence our behavior. I mean, we've seen it a lot in other organisms. We're really no better. I mean, sure, we can get up and give fancy talks. But we're not that much better. But you can't really take people and infect them with parasites to figure out if that's happening. I mean, there are a lot of really good reasons why you can't do that. 
But one thing that you could do is you could look at the effects of vaccination on behavior. So when you're vaccinated, you're getting an attenuated or weakened strain of a virus. And so perhaps you could use that weakened strain to see if there's any changes in behavior in people who have been vaccinated. And there's a couple typical things that you see with flu. I mean, sneezing and coughing are sort of argued to be behavioral changes in a sense. You're trying to get the flu out to other people. You're transmitting it that way. But in this study, they took a group of individuals and they vaccinated them. And they followed them for about two weeks and all the social interactions they had. And what they found is that two days after vaccination, the people who were vaccinated were more social than any other time during that two weeks. So not only did they interact with more people, actually they interacted with twice as many people in general, they tended to go to larger gatherings. And they controlled for things like, okay, maybe that two days fell on a weekend. They controlled for that as well. It just so happened that this two days following, you were more social. And why would that matter? Two days after you get the flu is the time you're most infectious or you're quite infectious and you don't have symptoms yet. So you could be out interacting with people because you're not sick, you don't notice that you're sick, and you're incredibly infectious. So what a great time for that virus to get you out and meeting more people. They're doing follow-up studies with a placebo, and I'm really excited to see where that goes. So what's the take home? What are we learning here? Well, there's a whole bunch of different mechanisms that parasites use to manipulate their hosts. Some of them do it just by being inside the host, just by making them look different. Some of them use these complex biochemical influences to change how their hosts behave. You have a huge diversity in species. You have unicellular organisms, very small, and then you have much larger, larger organisms like tapeworms. You have parasitoid wasps. I mean, just across, across the spectrum. And there's also multiple origins of manipulation. So across evolutionary time, manipulation of parasites of their hosts has occurred at least 20 times, and that's probably a huge underestimate. So it's obviously a very effective form of transmission, and we're just seeing some of it. So these mechanisms are incredibly complex, and we may be missing big parts of this. So uh, this is just one that I want to touch on briefly to show you how complex these things can be. So here we have a caterpillar, and it feeds on a plant. And when the caterpillar feeds on that plant, that plant emits some kind of warning, warning chemicals, like, ah, I'm being eaten. This is the worst. And we have a parasitic wasp then, or a parasitoid wasp, which comes and lays its eggs in that caterpillar. There's a hyperparasitoid, so these hyperparasitoid wasps can sense those chemicals that the plant's emitting, and it can sense if the caterpillar that's feeding on the plant is par being parasitized by a parasitoid wasp, and if it is, it will come and parasitize that parasitoid wasp inside of the caterpillar. So you have a caterpillar feeding on a plant parasitized by a wasp, which is itself parasitized by another wasp. You could very easily miss part of that somewhere along the lines. This is just the tip of things. I mean, there's still 7 million species left to be described, and they believe that 40 to 50% of them are probably parasites. Think about how many species are still left to be discovered and how many of them could be manipulating. And finally, the things we are picking up on are the things that are visual and they're moving and they're behavioral things and they capture our attention because they're so cool, but there's probably so much else going on that we're not catching because it's just, we just haven't seen it yet. So um, this is obviously the coolest topic ever. And if you're interested in it, this is a really great book by Carl Zimmer called Parasite Rex. Great read. It's kind of like a detective book, but all about parasites. I recommend that you have a look at it. Um, but otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.